Thank you, Peter. And uh, uh, thank you for the organizer to give me this opportunity to share uh, a little bit of our experiences in uh, so-called synthetic biology. Uh, as uh, I, I came from a very old laboratory that uh, we started from uh, fermentation. Um, and, but as Peter said, actually what I'm going to talk a lot of echoes what George talked about that and from different aspects, I mean from a small laboratory aspects. Um, first of all, I will say a little bit about when and where did I learn <laughs> synthetic biology. Uh, because I, uh, I was a really a, a microbial physi physiology work and, and uh, worked something on genomics. And I had basically had no idea on this uh, synthetic biology. But about uh, uh, three or four, four or five years ago, that uh, Huan Ming Yang uh, was involved in a in a, a program that uh, organized by the Chinese Academy of Sciences to make the roadmap for the next 50 years. And one of that, he raised this uh, topic about uh, origin and evolution of life. And in that, that includes the uh, uh, artificial life the, uh, as one of the topics. So we uh, simply uh, sketched a roadmap, actually very similar to what George talked for the last uh, slides about how we can go from the molecular modules and the characterization and uh, of the uh, uh, original lives, uh, the, uh, the basics of lives, and to the cell characterization. And so at the molecular level and the cellular level and the pathway level and also in the informatics level, and finally we can make a, an artificial cell. So that's the first time I learned this word, artificial life, and also synthetic biology. But very soon uh, our laboratory was established. So in Shanghai, we, uh, before that, we had a laboratory of systems biology. So it's very obvious at the beginning. And very, uh, after that, we have the laboratory of synthetic biology. But you can see this, these two laboratories is not in a, built in a remote area, I mean scientific area. We actually surrounded with many supporting fields and really indicating it's a, uh, it's a multidisciplinary area of research. In addition to that, we have uh, supporting from bioinformatics technology centers, so we have the computational power. And in, in addition to that, we have biomedicine transformation centers and also industry biotechnology centers. These two can transform what we learn from basic research academic studies to really applications in, for the society. So that's uh, something echoes the, the topic today we are going to study about the uh, economic impacts of social impacts of the synthetic biology. Now from the beginning, the historical aspects is what we start from. Actually, uh, we actually started from uh, fermentation and the classical genetics, and then later, later physiology, biochemistry, and molecular genetics. Uh, our laboratory, from my major professor to start with, studied this, uh, this bacterium, the Clostridium acetobutylicum, that produces uh, butanol. At that time, it was just a, uh, a solvent for, for uh, sometimes for medical and food industry, but nowadays it's a big candidate for biofuels. Uh, we started with from very traditional method and to get, from the, uh, get the bacteria from the soil. At that time, it's 66% uh, butanol, and the, uh, the yield is a per liter solvent with 9.67 uh, 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 grams. And then through this uh, classical mutation, selection, and screening, slowly it gets to this level. And so that was uh, actually uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the late 80s, and uh, that's at the level that we can get. And it's also industrialized. Uh, at the same time, my major professor also studied another important part of the, uh, the, for the uh, fermentation industry. That means to produce antibiotics. And this is nowadays turned out to be a very important antibiotics, which is uh, rifomycin. That is the, the first line medicine for TB treatment. And what he found was there was a, a, a highly really a correlation between the, 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 uh, uh, the nitrogen source versus the yield of the antibiotics. And finally, this is called the nitrate effect for rifomycin biosynthesis. And the effect is not just the, the secondary metabolites the, the antibody also through all the pathways of this, uh, uh, um, the, uh, the elementary uh, uh, metabolic pathways. 
And later on, we work on molecular genetics, and so we can start to find what's the key uh, players there for regulate these uh, pathways. For example, the glin R positively regulates the glin A transcription, which is uh, very important for the uh, uh, glutamine to be incorporated into the antibiotics. Of course, in order to do that, we found a very, very difficult barrier there to further uh, to push this forward is how to make the molecular manipulation systems in all the bacteria we want to study. So that's actually a big, big barrier there. I remember uh, when I uh, went to the institute, uh, some students was there already starting working on the transformation system of this uh, immaculatopsis in Mediterranean. But when I finished my study in the United States, went back to the laboratory, people are still working on that and they have not solved the problem yet. But over these years, this uh, more than uh, 15 years, we actually developed many of the, our techniques so we can do this not only in this bacteria, but also try to do it in the Mixococcus uh, xanthus. So we are expanding our capability of doing this kind of uh, system building. Now, from classical physiology genetics to this modern systems biology and synthetic biology, we need some bridging. The bridging is the, fundam the fundamentals is the genomics and omics. I think the genomics, particularly the microbial genomics, give our a very big uh, opportunity there to, to improve our study in microbiology. It's the, the advantage of microbial organisms as a target for genomic studies, including this is a highly diversified physiology. So you, you cannot find any other organism that has more opportunity there as you can to learn. Extremely long history of evolution, so it's a good model for evolution study. Close relationship with host environment. We not only can study it with the, the sand, the, the ocean, but also with the host, with our human beings. And the re relatively small genome size, much easier for sequencing and analysis, and relatively easy for functional analysis. With these, uh, particularly with this genomic sequence and genetic manipulation systems, it's a bottleneck technology that challenged the micro, uh, microbiology for many years, but nowadays we have this breakthrough. And with that, we have uh, a much better capability of learning complete and compact genomes, not like uh, uh, the high organisms that you spend many, many time but you cannot get the, the, the really complete genome. But this is a good system for annotation of life, to, to study the natural traces of life, and the global view of life. From that, we, we started uh, in the early days of this century to do the genomics of microorganisms. The first work, successful work, was our sequencing of this uh, very strange organism called the, uh, the uh, Leptospira interrogans. It's a spirochids. It's, a, it's very early evolved uh, eubacterium, has a lot of physiology that's similar to eukaryotes, to, to, uh, to eubacteria, and many different things mixed together in this organism. And we also have the way to, to, to sequence some big genomes uh, like uh, actinomyces, and to use that to study the molecular phylogeny and the metabolism. And also we have uh, work on the metagenomics and try to correlate the the metagenome of a, uh, uh, the, the, the gut and the, the urine metabolites. So with the met metabolomics as its phenotype studies, uh, genotype relationship, so you can correlate the, the metabolites with the bacteria in the gut. And we're also using the proteomics and particularly the acetylome studies try to figure out another path, another mechanism of regulating the, the, the the central metabolism, which is the acetylation and deacetylation of the, these enzymes. Now we are at the new beginning, is to go from omics to systems biology, using genomic technology and bioinformatics, using engineering uh, principles, and to have our new uh, philosophy and the methodology to do our traditional research. Um, so this is our view of the synthetic biology. It's based on this, uh, uh, the core molecular biology uh, principles and with the, the genomics as its a basic uh, technology platform. And we either take a top-down strategy of reverse engineering, that means systems biology, or we'll take a bottom-up strategy of forward engineering, go synthetic biology. I think these two are working together. Uh, 
First part is you need parts and devices. So we have this uh, system set up to get these parts from the, the metagenomics or the organism in different niches. These are the two niches. One is the anaerobic digester of the manure and another is the mites. So we can get many of these uh, genes including different enzymes for, uh, for the, uh, as our parts. So this is the list of these uh, uh, the cellulase genes identified in the, in the mite gut. And these are the cellulose uh, hydrolysis really gene clusters identified in the also mice gut uh, mitochondria uh, the, the microorganism and also yes yeah, the same but that's from the uh, biogas reactor and using that we finally we can uh, restructure the, the the fungi that produces the micro uh, the, the cellulase systems and the enzyme from different sources the parts from different sources. And another example is try to build up the system in a bacteria or move some system into another bacteria which is a better host or best, uh, better sachet. For example, this, if you need some technology there, so we develop some technology of a recombination uh, to have much efficiency uh, recombination. That's the phage, uh, uh, the Streptomyces phage uh, it, it recombinase. And using that, we can identify this very specific recombination sites. So we can design these uh, sites on our designed uh, parts or modules and put them together to make a tandem assembly of these pathways in a one uh, test tube, one step to do this all together. So right now we already established this is uh, the, the pathway, assembled the pathway for this uh, synthesis of some antibodies. Another is to improve the, the sachet uh, genome. That's uh, we want to make some uh, minimal streptomyces genomes, and using different methods, including direct knockout and also uh, to to do this uh, so-called markless deletion with the the, the SCS gene there. And so this is what we done on streptomyces silicola, and this shows how big the segment they can be deleted. And finally. Two important phenotypes. One is it's grow fine. It's uh, so the growth rate is very similar to the original, and second, the antibody production is dramatically increased. And finally, we came to the same story. We started with the butanol, and so with this uh, uh, new technology, there we start to to understand the genome and we start to knock out some of the pathways that pathways that diversify the the butanol production. And so we can increase to 37%, 44%, and to 80%, and finally, we reconstruct the pathway. So from the beginning, we modified and then reconstruct the pathway. Now we can get to the 95% of the butanol that produced. So in summary, uh, what is synthetic biology? I think there were three driving forces. Um, the first one is biotechnology driven. That's what we saw from many, many of the laboratories similar to ours. We start from fermentation, from traditional biotechnology, but we, then we use the synthetic biology concepts, technology uh, to improve our work. Particularly, we can do this not only the in vivo evolution, but also in silico evolution, and we can combine them together. And second, and the most important driving force is the engineering driving force. So we use the principles of engineering to make a module to sachet to go from design to construction. That means you can standardize your, your modules and then to do what you want to do as you design. However, this is awful difficult, so we are still working on this. And third principle, uh, driving force is life science driving force. This is a, a bottom-up strategy but not many people understand this is how important this strategy is to science. Because if we just uh, try to delineate the uh, system by synthetic uh, systems biology, probably still missing many important things there. But if we can synthesize the system, that means we have solved all the problems. So these are the three driving forces. And I think there are two aspects. The first is the synthetic biology um, aspects that means the engineering technology approach to 
to meet the challenge of human and human society, and to solve the problems of economy and environmental ecology. And the second is artificial life. That's a new scientific approach, and to study the origin and evolution of life. Finally, we can synthesize a, a, a totally synthesize a cell, and also we use that strategy, we can study the structural function of living organisms. Total all is a revolution of philosophy and culture. That's it. I still stick in my time. Thank you very much. Further ado, I think there's, uh, I thought George's talk was, was fantastic actually and described the whole landscape I think that could be included in synthetic biology. So I'm just going to focus on sort of one <clears throat> big uh, area which we believe uh, is very important and it's shown in this first slide which is the definition that we've been using at Imperial College in our centre and promoting and, and through other colleagues around the UK and the world in fact, which is to apply engineering principles to biological design. So it's this idea of synthetic biology strives to make the engineering and biology much easier and more predictable. And I think George covered those points uh, beautifully and also the very great difficulties associated with that. Now I borrowed this slide from a colleague in Edinburgh, Chris French, and I think it, it's a very sort of flippant slide, but it's interesting. Uh, and what it is, is that if um, design in current genetic engineering terms, if genetic engineers do, isn't really engineering, so the engineering equivalent of what genetic engineers do is to throw a load of steel and concrete into a river, and if someone manages to cross it, they call it a bridge. So that, um, I mean, it's a flippant comment, uh, and, but it illustrates, I think, the point about there isn't actually much engineering in genetic engineering as far as I understand it. So what synthetic biology, or one part of synthetic biology, a major part, aims to provide is some sort of framework to allow biological engineering using the principles of engineering design. And I think it's a very, very powerful framework indeed. And the question is why now? Well, of course, it's obvious. We, we have a huge amount of genomic, metagenomic information, uh, lots of open reading frames, lots of proteins, lots of functionality that we can harness. <coughs> and the other side of the equation is, of course, this extraordinary uh, explosion in the ability to, to make large pieces of DNA or synthesized DNA, <coughs> as shown here. And, of course, uh, George has already mentioned the complete synthetic genome of the mycoplasma genitalium that was done by Craig Venter and Hans Smith. So I think those two coins, genomes and genes, and the ability to synthesize large pieces of DNA, really makes um, this particular point in time uh, really interesting uh, from a, a an engineering design perspective. So the question is, can we use biology to build new biology? Um, and I guess the big question is biological systems are incredibly complex, and George already alluded to that. Biological systems are, in fact, inherently modular, so there's some hope there. There are a number of control elements that can be designed into biological systems. Um, and also there is um, the ability of systems biology, which is essentially the other side of synthetic biology, which will allow you to define mathematically systems-level uh, models of biological function. And then if you take all of that, put it together in a, in a systematic framework, which will allow you to design robustly and test and prototype, I think you've got a very powerful um, combination of disciplines. Now, Drew's probably going to mention this in his talks. I won't... Uh, um, um, spend any further time on this, but this came from Drew, Tom Knight, and Randy Retberg when, at MIT, and this idea of uh, trying to framework um, biology into components and systems and devices to allow you to conceptually build things in a more engineering way, I think is a very powerful framework indeed, and of course the point about modularity, characterization, standardization came up in the last talk. So the question, of course, is DNA a programming language? Uh, and this is a, a slide that Travis Bayer in our center uses quite a lot. The ability to sit at your computer, to do design, to send it off to a company, get the DNA back, put it in a bacteria, and it does what you predicted to do. Of course, this is a vision, <clears throat> but it's a very interesting vision, and one I think uh, has some reality. So the driving concepts uh, from our perspective, from my perspective, really, in synthetic biology at this point was DNA synthesis and assembly, the ability to build and combinatorial build large pieces of DNA, to start looking at chassis or hosts and really getting to grips with what the issues are when you implement your designs in those hosts, looking at parts, looking at design, and also, uh, to some extent, relating what you're doing to some other aspects of synthetic biology, particularly the, the synthetic cells and bottom-up approaches, of course, driven by applications, and of course, there's some societal issues as well. 
So this is the vision, I think, uh, illustrated again by Tom Ellis in the center, which is this book of automotive repair manual for a Porsche. So the, the vision is, can we have similar kind of books for E. coli, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and mammalian cells? If something goes wrong, you can just open the page, look at it, see how it works. And that is the sort of big vision. The idea of taking parts and devices, engineering systems, and making these rather cheap and self-sustaining microbes do functional things for us is a very, again, powerful paradigm. So the question is, if that is the vision, what do we actually need to achieve that vision? And can it be achieved? And I think George has alluded to some of the great issues that we face. Some of us uh, believe strongly that I think if we had uh, a very, very well-characterized biological parts and we had technology platforms to allow us to characterize parts and systems and devices, if we allowed rapid DNA synthesis to occur um, locally, if we had fully characterized chassis in all sorts of behavioral contexts, if we looked at large-scale DNA assembly, and if we developed BioCAD tools to allow this. So these are some of the underpinning kind of technologies, I think, which would benefit all of uh, life sciences, but certainly will benefit uh, bio uh, synthetic biology. And there are part registers, and I won't, I won't uh, allude uh, any more to this, except that there are it's, you know, approaches that allow us to look at that, and in fact, on the iGEM part register, there is about 15,000 biological parts there at the moment. Data sheets, so this is another concept which I think Drew and Dick will bring out, but one I think which is very powerful, the ability to have parts characterized, and of course, George illustrates very clearly the, the issue with context. You know, I might be able to characterize my part here, or device, or whatever, but when I put it into my microorganism, it will not work as I predicted, and I think that is a uh, 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 an interesting challenge for, for people who are working in this space, and I think it is, over, it is I think, do, we can actually get there, and this sort of illustrates, I think George already has illustrated this, but biological complexity, the systems of bio, the biological systems that adapt, evolve, networks interact, you do one thing in one part of a system and something else happens elsewhere, and all of those complex issues uh, need to be tackled face on, I think, if you're going to uh, really apply an engineering paradigm to, to uh, biology. Now, of course, uh, on the flip side of the synthetic biology coin, we have this wonderful evolving quantitative information and understanding of cellular function driven by systems biologists and bioinformaticians and mathematicians. And I think this is essentially, uh, I, if I'd have found a coin that had Robbie Lewis Stevenson on here and then I'd had Darwin on there, then you perhaps have the kind of the true essence of, of the, 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 the nature of systems and synthetic biology. They're both completely interlinked. And I think uh, the ability for us to understand biological systems uh, will allow us to do better and more informative design. So I think that that's already been, been brought out. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what's going on, at least in the UK uh, National Centre, which is at Imperial College. It's not the totality of work that's gone on in the UK, but it's the one I'm most familiar with. And I'm going to just illustrate some of those points uh, that I've made uh, with some project, with one project that's come from the centre. So the center was founded uh, in 2009. Uh, it's a partnership between Imperial College and the London School of Economics in terms of uh, the, the societal uh, aspects of synthetic biology. Uh, and uh, we've been going for a little while now. And these are the areas that are pretty much being driven in the, um, in the uh, center. I'm going to talk a bit about biosensors and one project to illustrate what I think the engineering design uh, paradigm can deliver. In the center, we are building high throughput um, uh, platforms and we are um, in fact developing, this is some recent data on a microfluidics uh, platform that we're developing for rapid part characterization, rapid device characterization and in this on the top left you're going to see a drop go through with a very strong promoter and in the bottom you're going to see a drop go through with a very weak promoter so we're beginning to develop systems that allow us to maybe, you know, maybe take those challenges about engineering and biological part characterization to another level. And these are the data sheets, I think, that probably Dick and others will talk about that we're beginning to accumulate. Okay, so I now want to just spend the last bit of my talk just illustrating some of those points, but through an actual research project, which I think illustrates it. So the idea was, can we design a synthetic biology biosensor that detects pathogenic bacterial biofilms? Now, the reason for doing that is that biofilms are very interesting, and has already been alluded to, they're uh, extremely uh, uh, sustainable in diverse environments. They're also a big problem. They're both, both a problem for uh, infections, and they're also a problem in industrial settings. And certainly uh, in hospitals, and, uh, there is a large amount of uh, infections due to biofilm formation. 
So what we wanted to do was think about that, and we came up with a project to think about whether we could design a detection system that allowed us to pick up biofilm formation on a urinary catheter. Uh, this is a big problem in hospitals, and we thought if we could have some sort of detection, early detection system, this would allow uh, doctors to be aware of any potential infection. So that was the aim, build a biosensor, and we wanted to choose an organism, we chose Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Now, because this is a conceptual project in that sense, we wanted to really follow the engineering paradigm here. Can we actually deliver this biosensor following this process? And the process, of course, uh, which uh, most engineers, and this is a very simplistic uh, process, uh, sorry, simplistic diagram, uh, which is the idea of specifying what you want, uh, designing it, modeling it, doing some really interesting modeling about the design, constructing it, that's the physical construction of the DNA, and then, of course, characterizing it, does the device work as to the specifications and going around that cycle. So it's very sort of traditional engineering, if you like. Can it work? Okay, so we chose uh, a very interesting biological system, which is uh, the intercommunication between microbial species that allows biofilm formation to occur, and that intercommunication occurs through a very small molecule called acyl homoserine lactam. So the design is really uh, embarrassingly simple, I would say, and that is that it's, can you design a biological device, if you like, that can detect this small molecule, uh, and therefore, when it detects it at a certain threshold, give an output signal, and that output signal would be some sort of green colorimetric output. And this would be the device, so it's a sort of sensor, like a three-stage amplification device, so it's very, very simple. Um, so by uh, engineering paradigm, you'd, set, you'd start off by looking at what the specifications were. So that's what you want to detect. You want to get it to this level of threshold because that's what physiologically is sent out when these cells communicate. The response will be in green fluorescence. You want a three to six hour fluorescence. And this part, well, the chassis we were looking at, well, if it was in a hospital, you wouldn't necessarily want a living chassis. So the idea would be we'd have to think about cell-free chassis and all the rest of it. And that's George already alluded to that. Uh, and so this was, uh, this was our starting point, actually. Uh, so we went into the design and we found that there are nice genetic circuits that detect uh, quorum sensing molecules uh, and one genetic circuit in Pseudomonas aeruginosa uses a transcription factor called Lazar. Lazar will bind this small molecule homoserolactone, it will dimerize, it will bind onto the promoter and it will activate a set of essentially quorum sensing genes that are regulated. So this is a neat little bit of biology but instead of uh, taking all of the quorum sensing genes all we're going to do is take the whole uh, Lazar system, but put an output uh, gene on there, so it's incredibly simple. But of course, being simple is very useful, so then we can think, well, okay, uh, that's the device, it's a simple, uh, simple device, we produce Lazar, we detect AHL, and then it binds and activates a gene or a, a transcription of an output protein. Of course, you can model it, you can think about all the different aspects of that system, the synthesis of Lazar, protein, messenger RNA, the binding of Lazar, the binding of Lazar to AHL, all of the different, the outputs, the synthesis of GOP. So it allows you to build a, a very simple but, but very useful mathematical model. This is before we've done any building of DNA at all. Uh, and in the uh, computer lab, of course, we can sit there and think about well, what, if we, what sort of promoter strength do we need if this system was working in the context uh, uh, ab initio, if you like, if it was just a single device. And of course, you can do all sorts of simulations and look to see what GFP output you'd need over time. So these are all kind of useful things, and it was giving us an idea about what sort of promoter. But of course, we've got to go find the promoter that we want. So then we go to the Pseudomonas genome, we look up all the Lazar promoters, we use bioinformatics, and we find them all. <laughs> then we essentially refactor them into our little device, and we test them. We want to see which promoters are actually going to give us the right kind of um, output that we want. So we did that, and we did this in vivo. So this is the testing, and we find there are three promoters that are very responsive to the autoinducer AHL, shown in the bottom here. Uh, and interestingly, some of the other promoters were not active in this, in this simple device. So we ended up with sort of three, two major devices, L and V. And of course, the beauty of having time and signal and concentration was that we could actually do some uh, nice diagrams to show us how this device, if you like, is performing. And that's shown here. And you can see the characteristics of the performance, at least under the experimental conditions we were using. Uh, are quite different, and that's interesting. Um, but then we wanted to really to test it out and see if it detected real biofilms. So we did this using a cross-streaking assay, and we found that actually this is the Pseudomonas aeruginosa. This is a collaboration with Alan Fuluid at Imperial College. And here is our living, if you like, device, living biosensor device with our little genetic circuit in there. And you'll see that we're getting very, very nice uh, green fluorescence protein 
uh, production very close to where the AHL molecules are diffusing, and particularly in this very virulent strain where there's a lot of AHL being produced, you're getting very nice um, uh, signals. So it looks to be working and detecting real biofilms in, in vivo, which I think was a really important step. But of course, uh, we wanted to look at um, some more uh, characteristics, so we ended up choosing a microtiter system where you can grow biofilms, uh, and you can take these biofilms, and then you can, you can uh, take the supernatant from those biofilms and look to see how our device would work. So here are some uh, experiments to show that. And we got some very interesting results in the sense that the two devices, if you like, that we these are two different uh, Lazar promoters. We're giving very different sensitivities. And we ended up with two devices working very differently depending on the strains, but they were working within the thresholds that we wanted. And if you start looking at, uh, again, some transfer functions to look at that, and this is the time, this is the time of biofilm growth, and this is the uh, output of GFP, you can see you're getting very different characteristics and very different um, functional outputs. But it's telling us that actually within the thresholds we're looking at and within the time frames we're looking at, uh, at least device V is giving us really good uh, signal. So basically, did we achieve them? I think in this very simple conceptual um, 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 project, um, I think we've achieved quite a lot. So we've very, got a very sensitive device for AHL. We're getting definitely down to the endogenous levels. There's no problem there. Good output, good time. And of course, the next stage is to actually now go away from the living device and actually put that into a cell-free system. And we're doing quite a lot of work on that at the moment uh, because it will be the cell-free system that would actually give us a real biofilm device that we might uh, be able to utilize. Now, the beauty, of course, is that this can be modular, so we can then look at other parts of biological systems and sort of modularize uh, our device, and we might be able to uh, get differential outputs. So again, I hope that's given you a flavor. It's a sort of um, conceptual project. I think it's been a really interesting project. It's allowed us to um, think about how you would do this if you were designing it engineering. It's a very simple device, and I accept all of that, uh, but I think it's been incredibly useful, and these are the people that did it. James Chappell did uh, most of the work. It actually started off many years ago as an iGEM project. Uh, Kirsten Jensen's been helping. Uh, Helga mickelson has been doing some of the biofilm assays. And these are the collaborators. Uh, and there is the funding. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, so we, we've, got, um, we've got about 10 minutes for, for discussion. And um, thanks to our two speakers showing iron self-discipline, thank you very much. Um, we, we do have plenty of time for you to, to pose your questions. So I'd just like to say, before you, you ask your question, could you say who you are and where you're from, please? And, um, and, and allow time for the microphone to get to you before you start. So who would like to start us off, please? John McCarthy, uh, University of Warwick, Life Sciences. A uh, question to Paul. Now, I think it's very interesting. When you were talking about the development of the project, it's a, a perfect illustration of actually the unpredictability of a biological system in that you found that you tried a number of different promoters, didn't you? And, and you not only found that the strengths differed in a way that you hadn't expected, but went between different systems, they changed in unpredictable ways. So I think this is sort of typical test case, if you like, for how you proceed in synthetic biology, because the, the issue is, is whether you're just going to take a pragmatic approach in future when you design new, new devices and say, oh, well, we'll just do the same thing, try a number of different things and proceed. Or are you actually going to go back and answer the question why, which is the system question, in order to provide understanding that will underpin an improved strategy for the future where you can increase the predictability? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. Um, from a pragmatic engineering point of view, the, the, the ability would be to go and make the device and get it working robustly and detecting threshold levels that you want. From a biological perspective, the, when I talked to the Pseudomonas guys, uh, a lot of those promoters were all bioinformatically analyzed. Uh, they weren't actually shown to actually be real. They were thought to be biofilm promoters. And when I showed them the data, they were quite surprised. And actually, I was quite surprised. They hadn't even looked at it and tested it in a very simple way like this. So in some senses, I think the building of these systems and devices will inform uh, the biological community enormously. But I think it's the way we do it. It's the, pr it's the thought process. It's the kind of prototyping, rapid generation of data and analysis. And, and that, that will help uh, the biological community, at least in that area, to, 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 I mean, and that is essentially the essence of what systems biology should be doing. 
but it's not answering your question directly. But I think the pragmatic way is we don't really care. We don't, no, you don't, we don't really care. We're getting good performance, good thresholds, the device is working, and if we can detect biofilms and catheters, I don't really care. That's not very helpful, I know. But. Questions? Richard Jones from Sheffield University. Again, it's to Paul. This question is directed, but I'd be uh, interested in all answers. So you, you made a very strong statement that biology is modular. Bi biology is complex, but biology is modular. And uh, I thought it was interesting that you put it so strongly, because you, know, you could have said it is convenient for us to assume that biology is modular. It's helpful for us to analyze biology as if it were modular. It's you know, it's worth trying to see if we can do engineering, assuming it is modular. But given the fact I think there probably are quite a lot of reasons to question that statement, at what point will you stop thinking it's modular in the face of, you know, if your pragmatic approach <laughs> stops delivering, when will you stop thinking it's modular? Um, I think uh, that's a very interesting and slightly provocative question. Uh, <laughs> um, I must say that I am actually a structure, molecu a structure molecular biologist so I, with a, a long uh, track record in, in solving protein structures and looking at how they work in biological systems. So I, I do understand that component of biology. I think what struck me about the synthetic biology approach is the ability to take bits and pieces of biology and to consider them, you're right, to consider them as modules and to see how far you can push that paradigm. I think biology has shown uh, conservation of functionality through all species and I think the, uh, you know, we all know that there are uh, context dependencies and there are systems perturbations and stochastic events and these, all of these things we all know. Uh, but in essence there are uh, components of biology which you can take from one particular organism and put it into an organ another organism and get it to work. So by, in some essence, that is a sort of modularity, if you like. Uh, but we can argue uh, over the, you know, the, the sort of uh, nuances of the name and the definition and all the rest of it. I think the bottom line is that you can take pieces of DNA from all of the diversity plug them together and get them to function as you predict. Maybe not efficiently, maybe not optimally, but you can do it. So that, I think, to me argues that biology has a modular component to it, and maybe I shall put that on my slide next time I present it. Drew Endy from the United States. Uh, if I'd offer just an observation, I, I, I suspect biology is modular, modular when it's under selection to be modular, and a question for synthetic biology is can we shape those selections in new ways? For the panel, given that this is a, a subheading, the research environment, for both of you, I wonder if you'd be willing to comment on how is the research environment? So you're presenting very nice work in context and ambitions. Yeah. Um, is it going well? Where are the, the, the gaps? Where are the gatekeepers? Do you not have the right combinations of people? Do you not have enough competition? Do you have too much support? Something else? So, so <laughs> any, any comments about like the research environment in China? <laughs> if you don't mind. <laughs> Okay, I start with um, definitely not too much support, too little support. <laughs> uh, I think um, uh, consider the, the environment. What I what I talked about is really we we grew up from an environment which is not synthetic biology, which is traditional biology or traditional biotechnology. However, uh, if we can uh, uh, we can gear this direction into that that uh, we we try to lead the direction into that. Uh, lead the, the research into that direction, I think it's a, it, 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 probably in China it's a good way to do that. Because uh, uh, I, I think the questions previously asked, the, I asked myself many, many times. So uh, people in, in China also talk about that. You, you just change the name of what you are doing, and then you, you say you are doing in synthetic biology. Uh, so what, what I keep asking myself what, what we are doing, whether it is synthetic biology or not. I think we, we are doing something synthetic biology, but that's the beginning of synthetic biology, not really the, the, the final goal of synthetic biology. For instance, uh, if we do it in a, a biotechnology uh, sense, then uh, we uh, uh, originally we are just modifying something to, to make something happen. But uh, right now we, are, have, uh, we have the sense of to, 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 to design something then to, to uh, integrate what we want to do to make it happen. And second, to, to the modulation, I think this is, uh, uh, 
the two aspects from, from nature, it is modulated, particularly in our, for example, when we uh, study our synthesis of antibiotics, it's, it's the modules of the, the synthesis of polyketides, all these things. Uh, however, um, I think from engineering aspects, that's really different from what we used to that, is we try to make modules that can do many things in the same, on the same standardization. And then uh, in the next uh, generation, probably if we want to make a new antibodies, we don't have to start from something that in the nature, but from the storeroom, the, the registry to make it. And so this is the, really the final goal of the engineering aspects of the, the synthetic biology. So that's, uh, we are towards, going towards that. But for doing that, it is really need a good environment because it was not there previously. So what I mean easy is if you have some environment previously was there, and it's easy to start from that. But if it's not there, then you want to get the support from society. It is difficult. And the scientists are also afraid of doing something which is totally new to them, not they used to that. So you, they have to quit something they used to do that and to do something they never did it. And that's also difficult. I'll comment on the UK, if you like, Drew. Um, the BBSOC has a number of networks of, uh, which would encompass all of the areas that George talked about, the chemical biology, the synthetic, the systems biology, synthetic biology, all of that. Those networks are very broad. They've met. They're coming to an end now. And I guess from that will be some coalescence of, of interactions and disciplines to where this field goes. Then uh, also in Europe, there is a, a, a big call, as you know, for a standardization uh, in synthetic biology uh, at the moment um, under framework uh, seven. And so that's actually happening. So I think in that sense, there are beginning to be the, the, the sort of shoots of some of the uh, infrastructure, which I think you and Dick are going to talk about, that's needed to actual, actually promote the field more broadly. Um, uh, and, uh, and I think in the UK there's a particular debate going on about, you know, what is synthetic biology still? Um, because, um, and, and that, you know, that's, that's an interesting debate, uh, and I think at some point that's got to <laughs> end. We've all got to move on uh, and actually do what we think is, is right. But, uh, so, that, that, so I think in some senses there is a sort of, it's a sort of seeding uh, period, uh, at least in, in, in the UK, from what I can see. Well, um, unless someone is burning to ask another question, I don't see any reason to divide you from your coffee.